I'll start by admitting to having almost nothing at all to do with prehistory. Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I definitely read a lot about it and heard a lot about it in my first year as an undergraduate and then moved on to other things. I work predominantly as a buildings archaeologist, um, working with the contemporary built environments and historic buildings. Research-wise, I'm particularly interested in things being made, um, how new things come into being in the world around us and what we can do with that as archaeologists. So this is going to be a a perspective from that world that I think will be both slightly different and uh, slightly familiar from the papers that we've heard already. There's been some uh, <coughs> great overlaps. So I'm going to talk mostly about art works. Um, artworks, of course, involve a complex interplay of different temporalities. That's not um, won't be a surprise to anyone because everything does. We, we can safely assume that complexity to be the case, but that's too big. If we just go for, uh, for complexity, we've got the potential of the entire world, all of past, all of the present, all of the future, involved in anything in the built environment. And while that, that mass, that idea of infinity, can be really inspiring, and it can give you a certain amount of freedom as an archaeologist. It can be uh, useful, I think, to focus um, a little uh, closer and ignore infinity for a minute. In this title for the paper, I've called it Clumps. Now, I did have a vague idea about theorizing clumps um, in, in, in quite some detail. I'm, I'm not quite going to, but suffice to say that these clumps are moments of revelation of the nature of that messy temporal infinity that we can go and see in the built environment uh, when artworks or buildings have their temporal contexts and the implications of those temporal relations realized and made visible. It's also necessary to understand temporality in art for a number of other reasons. The first is that temporality and understanding it's really important just for understanding artworks as art, something that um, I think can end up being a bit secondary in the way that we use art as archaeologists. The second is that ideas of temporality, understanding what that is, focus straight in on the connection to lived experience people's lived experiences of landscapes where art is. People experience things in time. Multiple temporalities are particularly important because it's here that we begin to acknowledge that spaces and places and things are experienced and used and countered by different people, different groups and different communities who are all using those same spaces and may think about and use temporality completely differently. And where that probably comes most into my work and why that's quite important for me at the moment is in heritage interpretation because when we're looking at changing places or even places that have been subject to more formal archaeological investigation and then transmitting that knowledge to other people, it helps to know um, as well as you can, thinking about temporality, what places were like in the past with this multiplicity of different people in different groups, but also that when people are encountering your heritage interpretation, that is also a durational experience that everyone will have slightly differently. I'm going to give two examples. Um, the first will be to look at sculptural public art. The idea of multiple temporalities in and around works themselves and how those different temporalities become enacted for different future thinking reasons. Um, then I'll go on to talk a little bit about performance and performance remains and focus there a bit more on the specific creation of durations, the physical remains of those created durational experiences and how those experiences become transmitted 
through what's left at the end. So take us to Bristol. Um, the red marker up there is Cabot Circus Shopping Centre. This was the, the focus of my PhD research. I followed the shopping centre being built, um, focusing mainly on the public art programme that went alongside that and how artists were understanding that process of change, turning those understandings into things and putting them back into that changing environment. And I looked at the site itself and those artists, but also sort of looked around the whole of Bristol to try and get a good contemporary archaeological understanding of the process of change and how it fits into the city. What was probably the most obvious outcome for me was that this was all entirely about the future. Um, as all of these new buildings are being built, as artists are creating stuff, um, you could, if you want, by extension, uh, bring in something as small as all things ever made, or some sort of comment on tomorrow. And that was the frame with which I approached this art project as an archaeologist. And here's a nice example. This is a piece called Roche by Susanna Heron. It's a structural component of the Harvey Nichols House of Fraser uh, building at Cabot Circus. This is a, you can just about see that there's an etching on here on the bronze work, and you can see it on the glass above. Um, Heron spent time in Bristol walking around, trying to understand what the city is, and she decided that it has a certain quality of light that she linked to its maritime history and the river running through the city. She turned that into this design, which is etched on the panels and on the glass, and has been incorporated into the uh, structure of the shopping center. What's really striking about Heron's work, as she describes it herself, is that she intends it to be site-specific, but site-specific in the future. She is aware that this is a new thing, but because it's about this um, enduring Bristolian light, she says that it will become site-specific over time. It's here in the present, but it is very much of the future. And the image on the right you might just be able to make out that a couple of the glass panels, this one and this one, sort of look a little bit like they've been frosted. That's because they've been shot. Um, on two separate occasions, people driving along this road out towards the M32 have stopped and taken the time to fire an air rifle at this piece of art. <laughs> now, <coughs> at one level, it's somebody messing around. At another level, it's a protest. At another level, uh, it is a puncturing of the, that duration, that future site specificity of Susanna Heron's work. It is a comment that that idea of the ideal future that she's imagining through this shopping <coughs> centre um, is perhaps not ideal at all. It's a clash of trajectories. And if you want to maybe think about that work and Cabot Circus and the air rifle pellets as the beginnings of an assemblage, then that's absolutely fine. Um, thinking about the future in public art, and I think this might be the first table full of words I've seen at the conference. So I'm happy to give you that on the last afternoon. Um, I used a lot of writing by Mark Hutchinson in this great article, Four Stages of Public Art, if you look at the two columns on the left, that's, that's, that's Hutchinson. What he does in his work, he sees that there are this series of things that happen with any artwork that gets put into the built environment. You first get non-unity, when a new thing is placed into an existing uh, location. There is negation, as the impl implications of the art object are realized and acted upon, e.g. people don't like it. There's totality where these things sort of um, take on their own lives. The art object is what it was intended to be. It's also how people have appropriated it. 
And then finally, there's a stage of agency where all of this comes together and changes what art can be in the future. Now, how I was thinking about this is the column on the right, which is about different kinds of future, um, which we'll skip to another table. Oh, here we go. Futures, different futures. Um, so looking at the presence of those different um, periods of Hutchinson's in the built environment, you can see that there are different futures, ideal, future present, uncertain future, inhabited future. It's not exhaustive. But I think that we can connect these different futures um, to different groups within the built environment, different people. The ideal future is the future of developers and architects. The inhabited future is that future where the site's been reclaimed by protesters and activists and local residents. I think thinking about it archaeologically, trying to understand these works within the context of the whole city over time, um, we can fairly safely, I think, say that although Hutchinson sees his four stages as happening one after the other, they actually all happen at the same time. And what happens in turn is these different ideas of the future get um, enacted and acted upon for different reasons by people. But they are always there. It is not about chronology, as we've heard already. It is about multiple temporalities all existing together. And that's what we see here. We don't, we don't have Susanna Heron's idea of the future and then it stops because it gets shot. Um, there is this brief enactment of a different opinion of what the future should be or what the future should not be. Um, of course, the glass has been replaced. The air rifle pellets have gone. I assume, um, and Susanna Heron's work is still there, still enduring to um, become site-specific in the future, as she says it. Moving on to performance, and performance remains. Um, I wanted to bring performance in because I think performance does some very, very specific things with time. A lot of performance, not all, is um, overtly about the creation of a durational experience. It's not just that something happens to take a long time. There's a lot of thought that goes into um, what that duration is. And part of that is about creating a certain kind of relationship between a performer and an audience, bringing in different, understanding, different understandings of time and space, economy, which is particularly important, um, the, the work that goes into creating a durational experience on the part of the performer, but also often the work you have to put in as an audience member to experience that duration. What we'll also see, and I'll show you in a second, um, is that a lot of performance also includes the performative creation of an archive. And most performances have both intended and unintended physical remains. And that's where I'm going to um, take us now. I talk a little bit about a Taiwanese artist in America called Teching She. Um, has anyone come across She before? I'm not surprised. Um, in the late, late 1970s and early 80s, Shea created a series of year-long performances. Um, they are ostensibly comments on the immigrant experience in America. This is his second piece, known as the clock piece. He's, he spent a year um, punching into a time clock on the hour, every hour, for a year. I think he missed about 140 um, out of 8,500 or something like that. Um, He'd also previously done one where he lived in a cage, built in a room, for a year. But what I want to look at is um, one year performance, 1981-1982, um, Shea's outdoor piece, where he spent a year living outdoors in New York. Um, in a sense, that's that's just a thing. It's a year of someone's time 
in New York. But we can really complicate it. We can see not just the personal duration experienced by the artist in there. Um, we can imagine fleeting encounters that Shea has with other people. Um, there's also the enduring city. The sort of um, the city as a kind of metaphor for the geological time that we've heard about in some other papers. I think it's really interesting. And of course, one of the things that first starts to puncture that idea of the year of durational experience is the fact that we have photographs that are almost the opposite of that, um, that long experienced time. And of course, Shea's work is exhibited. Um, how do you exhibit a year of time? Well, you reduce it to something else. Um, you probably can't make out the words on here, but what you see in each of these images um, pasted on a wall is a map of lower and a couple of sort of mid um, Manhattan. And they take this idea of a year and turn it into a daily route and the place I slept, the place I defecated. Um, that to me is now starting to do a very, very different thing with that, with that concept of a whole year of experienced time. We're reducing it to objects, to roots, to events within. He's also exhibited the clothes and objects he wore and carried with him um, for the course of that, that year. And that's doing something very, very different as well, because we're taking time and reducing it to objects, or representing it as a, as a collection of objects. And well, so I guess we could talk about this as assemblage as well. Um, the artwork in this case is one year outdoors in New York. That's, that's a thing which is experienced by Shea. <coughs> um, but that has lots of outcomes that aren't just Shea's personal experience. For a start, Shea being outdoors for a year in New York will have had an impact on New York City, however imperceptible. There are also the personal encounters that people have had with Shea, whether they are conscious that he is an artist performing a piece or not. There is the mapping that I've shown you, there are the photographs that I've shown you, his belongings, but also this work goes on to have its own afterlives in his own work, where the experience of creating that piece and its reception goes on to inform other work, but also in other artists as they become inspired, and, um, or archaeologists who become inspired to create their own durational projects. So I've done a bit of, ex uh, a bit of experimenting with um, year-long blogging projects, which is very, very different to being um, outdoors for a year in New York, but um, weirdly stressful to have to think about blogging every day for a year. And what these things do, though, they are all individual outcomes. Some of them are intended, some of them are not. But they all have to come together into our understanding of what that work is, despite the fact that we can't get back to the actual experienced time of the year outside in New York. I'm going to wrap up by just uh, skipping over a couple of other instances of interesting duration. Um, the first that you may have come across, the artist is present by Marina Abramovich. Um, she sat in a chair in a gallery in New York for three months and you um, queued up and sat opposite her for a certain amount of time. Um, that's really interesting for its three monthsness. Um, it's also really interesting that people had to queue for hours, um, days I think at one point, um, days of queuing just for that few minutes of of experience, and that might be why if you watch the film about the artist is present, how many people sit down and burst into tears. Um, I also wanted to mention Mike Pearson, um, whose uh, book Marking Time is um, a great piece of writing about performance and archaeology, but also a really, really fantastic guide to Cardiff, and, and it includes in its opening chapter this, um, this great description of trying to relive a past performance through a series of photographs that luckily have a clock in the background um, 
the, the partial memory of what this duration um, was at the time. Trying to now refit that and create a new memory. And Mike was telling me earlier on he's going to be doing some more work in a sort of similar area to that next year, so you should keep an eye on it. So, well, that's, I, I mean, that's just lots of stuff. I'm just going to conclude very uh, uh, briefly, keeping it fairly open, just by bringing us back to this, um, and say why I think mul multiple temporalities are so important for archaeologists and heritage professionals. Um, people do experience things very differently and in different temporalities. Um, they also, people create temporalities and experience duration um, that are really important but that we can't experience too because we're not them and it is not them. There are um, intended and unintended outcomes from um, both sculptural artworks and performance pieces and all of these start to take us to uh, a good understanding of how people connect to the landscapes they're in and how we can start to work between different individual people, different groups and different communities in trying to understand this all uh, together. I'll stop, that's probably about a minute over. <laughs>